BC. Uh, they clearly in Egypt, in this area not far from Palestine, were being used by humans uh, at least 300 years before Albright's date, and maybe four or 500 years or more. We don't really know for sure. Uh, so this uh, opened up a whole new way of thinking for me about the date of Abraham's camels. I was raised in a, a Christian family, but um, when I was young, my parents had uh, some issues and they divorced when I was about 12 years of age. And uh, up to that time, they'd been pretty faithful churchgoers, and that made an impact on me. My, my grandparents on both sides of the family were also Christians and made sure I uh, went to church school and uh, you know went to church and so forth. And I always appreciated their support and their insight and so forth. But uh, when my parents split up, um, that kind of left a lot of questions for me. You know, suddenly church didn't seem so important. My parents at that time quit going to church. I was even told I didn't have to go to church. <laughs> so from about the time 12, 13 on, I was pretty much on my own to make you know, decisions about whether I believed in God, whether I believed in Christ, whether I believed in the Bible and so forth. And, uh, but my grandparents kept encouraging me, and uh, while I had a lot of questions, you know, as I was going through high school and going through college, particularly in the area of evolution, you know, uh, a lot of my friends that I would hang out with went to the local high school, and they would tell me about the theory of evolution. And I was trying to make this all come together about what I was learning about the Bible on the one hand, and yet what uh, uh, science seemed to be telling me on the other hand. So this was a struggle I had all the way through my high school years, and when I went to college, I chose to go to a, a Christian college, Pacific Union College. Uh, my parents weren't particularly keen on the idea at the time. Uh, they didn't say no, but they weren't particularly excited about it. But I went anyway, and uh, while I was there, I majored in two areas, not because I necessarily was interested in these areas for career choices, but because uh, I was curious <laughs> about whether God really existed or not. So I majored in theology, religion, religion major technically, to explore the questions about God and uh, what does the Bible really say about God and about uh, Christianity. And I also majored in biology at the time because I was curious about what science had to say. And uh, I had a lot of questions, you know, and I was looking at the different ways science would approach reality and the way, uh, you know, theologians would approach reality and trying to make this all come together. So, so that was sort of my background, actually. Um, I discovered that answers aren't always easy to come by, but I also discovered that science doesn't always have the answers neat and clean either. So I sort of resolved my own mind to give faith a chance. So archaeology gave me a chance to actually uh, study some of the challenges against the Bible, look at the archaeological evidence and material and see, is the Bible completely out to lunch? Is it completely fictitious? Or are there archaeological discoveries that, uh, I don't like to use the word prove the Bible, but are they compatible with the Bible? Is it totally unreasonable to think that there might be something to the Bible, that the Bible might have something of value, that it might even have something that's historically rooted and grounded? And my own conclusion has been, that yes, there, there is reason uh, to believe that the Bible writers knew what they were talking about, and there's enough there to hang, uh, hang your faith on, so to speak, although to me, faith is still primarily a, a, a personal relationship with God. It's not something you get just from reasoning it out. But I do think that uh, belief in God and belief in uh, the biblical story can have a, a rational and a reasonable component. Well, I've been fascinated by the science of archaeology. All of these amazing things from the past that tell us what has happened. I'm also fascinated by the Bible and the record of the past that it gives us. When those two things come together, it's truly magical. In the case of Dr. Yonker, it's interesting to me that so many scientists had not noticed those amazing camel petroglyphs, and yet his mind, prepared by his understanding of the writings of Moses, prepared him to see camel petroglyphs that others had not noticed.
many hundreds of years ago, the famous Italian author Dante. of all the days of the week. He made Sabbath the pinnacle, the crowning jewel of creation that he's the most pleased about. He wants to spend that time with us. Let's sing number 385, crowning jewel of creation. 385. What a beautiful time. Thank you to all the musicians. This is a time in our service for the children. And uh, you can go to the back of the sanctuary to get your little basket for the lamb's offering. And uh, Dr. Bubbles is going to have a children's story for you. And for those that are tempted to run for the fire extinguisher, there is no need. Oh boy. 
boy. Here we go. one. Welcome. Welcome, boys and girls. So good to see so many kids. I know you too. You look familiar. Brother, I always see that coming up. Hi, you guys! Oh, so many friendly faces. Uh -uh, there's an age limit, sir. Sorry. Oh, okay. No, you can come up here. Hello, neighbor. Okay. Wow. Well, welcome. Hello, neighbors. Come on up. Oh, come on here. Come through. Come on and find a seat. Hi, boys and girls. Are you guys there? Hi, good morning. Hi, well, it's great to see you this morning. Oh, do you guys know who I am? Yeah. Yeah, what do I do? Well, how about what do I do? I'm Dr. Bubbles. Okay, to you guys. And uh, what do I like to do? What do you think? Science experiments. Now, but I like to do them when they, uh, they can teach us something as well. So we're going to, well, we're going to do that. I'm going to move this around so you guys can see it. And uh, I'll we'll let the kids get up here. All right. And I'm going to stand over here so you guys can see it. All right. So today we want to, we're going to talk about, well, this is an amazing Sabbath. We're talking about creation. Oh, I think it's something we should talk about in every Sabbath. And we often read the Bible, and that's great, and recite the Ten Commandments. But I think doing some science experiments are, are awesome ways to enjoy the Sabbath. And these are things you can actually do at home, and I'll try to explain that, okay, as we go along. So I think on the Sabbath, we should remember two things. We've been working on this at home. What are two things you should remember about every Sabbath? What is it, Christiana? Do you remember? Or Nathan, what do you think? We should keep it holy, okay, but we need to remember. So God says we should remember. What should we remember? You remember? <laughs> that he made us and that he saved us. You see, I think if you believe that Jesus can save you, you should believe that God made you and created you. These two things are almost the exact same thing. So if you believe that God made the world, you should be able to believe that he can remake you. They are two things that are one and the same. So we're going we're gonna to do that here. So I have a special, well, an unfortunate bottle here. Does anybody know what it says on there? Sin. Sin. Very good. We have some uh, good readers there. Good word. Uh, not that, well, it's a bad word, but uh, oh, I have some sin in here. Uh, has God been able to teach us or tell us what sin is so we know how to identify it? What do you think? Yeah? I think you're right. How does he told us to identify what sin is? Do you, how do we know where sin is? Does anybody know? No? Well, man, that's probably why we should have this children's story then. How do you know where sin is? It's in the jar? How do you know? You just sort of guess? And if someone gets mad at you, you've done something sinful? Is that how it works? What do you think? Something bad, just like anything bad, like spill your milk, that's something bad. Okay, being mean to someone. What do you think? Is there some way that, what does God, God call sin? We might have to go to some of the older kids and ask. 
All right, parents. They're not, this, is, this should be an easy answer here. What do you guys think? Ah, okay. Oh, thank you very much. It is breaking God's law. So that means we need to know what God's law is. Does any, can someone just tell me one or two things from God's law? Yeah. There's a big part of it is about helping others. That's exactly right. Oh, honor your father and mother. Oh, your parents are so happy. What's that? Oh, these guys are laughing. What'd you say? Don't steal. Don't steal. Oh, those are good ones. Can you think of another one? Cadence? Don't worship, idols. don't worship idols. So these are good things. There's more of them. And so your parents are supposed to be teaching you these things. Like when you wake up and when you walk around that you would know these things because uh, when you do them. So you guys do know, it sounds like. So when you do know, I'm, I'm going to pretend, uh, whoa, let's not do this one. Let's do this one. Someone help me pick out this little one. So in here, this looks like a little person, doesn't it? Oh, it's a cute little person. Did you know that cute little people... They can sin. Maybe there's a little candy or something that you saw at the store and you get stained in your life. But it's not just for little kids. Maybe it's slightly older kids, okay? They too, oh man, I got some on me, can be stained. Oh, isn't that awful darkness there? Let's put that out there for you guys to see. But you know, it's not just little kids, it's older people. Maybe they have a rounder belly to them. <laughs> they too can be stained when they break God's law. Oh, and you maybe have some different shape people. You know, it doesn't matter what shape you are, what age you are. We need to know what God's law is so that we can understand that when, it, when we break his law, we become stained and sinful, and that's a part of us. But sin is sin, and it doesn't matter who you are, even if you're tall and skinny and in good health. There's a lot of thin people out there who are, think they're pretty self-righteous. They're, they're in good shape, so good for you guys. But you can sin just like the rest of us and become stained. Oh, look at that, wow. Look at all that nasty sin that is in these people's lives. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could see sin like this? I think if, you tr if we train and we think about it, we could see what sin is. We often don't practice thinking about what does God want us to do and what does sin look like. But if we could see it like that, we would say, oh, I don't want to be like that. I want to be pure like God made me. Did you know that he gave you a way so that you could be pure? How, how, what, what can we do? Pray. pray. What, what should we pray, though? It's that simple. We just need to pray and ask God to forgive us. We should repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. I was mean and I didn't obey my parents. I didn't mean to steal that. We should give it back and make it right. And so God has made a way that when you ask for that, that he can... Put some vitamin C in your life. Now, I call this vitamin C because it's vitamin C. It's ascorbic acid, if anybody's curious, for the chemical name. And you can get this at the store. You can actually, so the black stuff in here is iodine. You can get that at the store, too. And then I have a secret ingredient called starch that helps make it really dark. But I like to think of vitamin C as vitamin Christ. Okay? Because Christ can come into our life. When we ask, you say, Jesus, you died in that cross. You spilled your blood. This is not Jesus' blood. This is vitamin C, but we'll pretend. Okay? And even little kids, just a few drops here. Let's put some in there. <gasps> Jesus, forgive me. And you too can be clear again. All right? Oh, wait a second. Maybe you need to be older. Can that work? Yes, even if you're a little older and a little bigger. You can just ask Jesus, and he will make you clean. Can he do that for anybody? Let's find out, even the portly person. <laughs> I'm working on it. Oh, wow, Jesus can take away your sin. All you have to do is ask and repent, he says. Oh, here we go. Let's try it on here. 
What about this person? Yes, even this person right here. Wow, that is clear. God will make you clear. White as snow. I love living in Michigan because we know what that means. <laughs> we will certainly, how about those skinny people? They can be sinful, but they too can be clear as well. Oh, there we go. This one's a little harder to mix. Okay, chemistry is about mixing. Don't let them tell you that it happens by itself. You need to mix it, okay? Wow, that is amazing that God can make us pure. You know what? I'm looking for the day when God is going to recreate this world and he's going to do something big. So I thought I should try to do something big for you guys. You see, God is not going to just only get rid of the sin in our lives. I think he's going to try to do it for the whole world. So I brought the sin of the world. Here, it's kind of heavy. Ah! Ah! Oh, man, that is heavy. Whoa! 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 Wow! Wow, that is heavy. That's a lot of work. It is, it, seriously, it's really heavy. Wow. All right, does anybody need their CrossFit workout? You can help me when you get done here. Wow. You think a little bit of Jesus is going to take care of all of that? What do you guys think? Do you believe that he can? Yes, I think so too. Let's see what happens. If we put some Jesus in there, we're just going to pour him all out. <laughs> just in case. All right. And we're going to just dump that in there. I think we need to do a little mixing. This is where the heft comes in. All right. This is the, oh. Is it clearing up a little bit? It just takes a little bit of time and God's power. You'll see a little floaties in there. And it's going clear, except for the few little floaties in there. Wow. God can take care of the sin of the world. The floaties will go away. There might be a few stains and things that we'll remember about sin that we don't want to go back there ever again. And God's going to help us to get over sin and get rid of it. Once and for all. Yes. Nice. Why don't you do what? Why don't you just put the thing you put in the big thing? Into the small ones? No. Oh, I thought about that this morning. Well, we want to think about God and what he did. So you guys, we're going to make mistakes, but I'm here to tell you, God can recreate you and make you clean because we trusted him to make this world. And I look forward to doing more experiments with you guys, maybe this afternoon, and hearing what this man over here has to say for us today. Yes, and there is a lot of great things, but we have to trust God that he made the world and that he can remake it and remake us. Let's pray to thank him, okay? Father God, thank you so much for Sabbath. May we remember every Sabbath that you made this world and you can remake us because you have saved us from sin. Thank you for cleansing it from our lives. And eventually you're going to just get rid of it all in this world. Thank you so much. Bless these kids so that they'll learn the law so we can see that sin and run away from it. And uh, we thank you for Jesus that will clean us up when we get dirty. And I pray in that name. Amen. God bless you. You may go back to your seat. Hi, I'm Jim Gibson, director of the Geoscience Research Institute. I'm here in the Alps studying the landscape with a group of church leaders. And what I see here is evidence of design and evidence of catastrophe. I see design in the beautiful and abundant wildflowers all around me. I see catastrophe in the large scale tectonic movements in the mountains and the massive scale and I'm reminded of the Creator God who pays attention to the little details of the flowers and has the power to move mountains. What a glorious opportunity 
for administrators to understand God's beautiful handiwork. To me, the creation story, the global flood, explains so much. And yet we have questions, but let me tell you, God's word is sure. You compare yourself to this, you know, this is a magnificent uh, creation. So the building, the foldings of rocks, compared to that, we are nothing. Sometimes that we, we try to co question God with the little knowledge that we have. The mighty God, the powerful God, the creator that we worship, that believe in. That's so mighty, that's so awesome, that's so powerful. I may not be able to use all the scientific terminologies that we have learned, but at least I can tell those who I will get into contact with that truly everything I have seen during this G Geoscience uh, uh, conference is uh, nothing but total manifestations of God's power and might. We can communicate with each other and tell each other about the great things that God has made, but we need to see it for ourselves. And so church leaders, as we come out here in these mountains and we look around and we see the scale, we see the questions that we really don't know how to answer, we see the questions that we have had that we find answers for. And there's something about seeing it for yourself that benefits church leaders and will benefit church members and the public as well. To have to stop and come and have a direct contact with nature, it has helped me so much to see nature in a, having a closer look on the mountains and have beautiful explanations. We have a nice team of colleagues from the GRI that help us understand and interpret what is written in the rocks, the message that we can understand. For me, it was really helpful because, you know, I had a very vague idea and now I can start understanding better. Without creation, there is no need for God. Without creation, why do we need the Sabbath? Without creation, why do we need salvation? We need to go back and see God and what he has done and be confirmed that through him we are saved. So as we look at creation, it confirms our faith, it strengthens us, and therefore we cannot rule creation out of our relationship with God or out of our relationship with each other because creation helps us to see what God has done, confirm our faith in him, and strengthen our belief. Our God is great. Creation has always been very foundational to who I am as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I am not only a believer in an omnipotent and omniscient creator God, but the creation also reminds me that he created me. And that brings me to the word intimacy, that the creator God desires a relationship with me. And my heart goes out to him and I praise him for the creation. When I think of the great upheaval, uh, or what one person calls the decreation of the earth, and yet in the midst of all of that conflict, there was an ark and God protected the ark and the people in the ark. I think of the power of God and I think of the grace of God. There are millions and millions of people in the world who do not understand and who do not believe in creationism. And as a church, our responsibility is to share this uh, beautiful message with these people. This uh, conference gave me a great learning experience. Thank God and thank Yara. We can read a lot about creation in books and we learn a lot. We are inspired by the Psalms and by writings of others who have looked into nature and by studying in school with the, the biology class and the geology class. But there's nothing like getting into the mountains themselves, looking at the rocks, looking at the flowers, looking at the glaciers, the mountains, the rivers, the, the multitude of things in nature to bring home to us the lesson that God is the designer, that this world has experienced a catastrophe, that God is here and guiding everything. The doctrine of creation is a kind of a pillar. If I cannot believe on in the create doctrine of creation, there is no foundation for any other doctrine. I'm grateful to God and to 
the GRI for uh, all these things that we have learned during this trip. I was impressed about the earnestness of our presenters that they could still maintain their faith uh, when they have such knowledge, when they are exposed to such knowledge that has the potential of wiping away one's faith. That, that really I liked. And I saw that they see in creation that there is a designer. And when they showed us that these things could only have happened through a designer, I was truly blessed. I believe so strongly that everything that we see was created by God in six literal days, as the Bible says. So I am a creationist. For me to know that I have created for a purpose by a God who's powerful enough to solve any problem I may face, wise enough to guide me through any challenge I may face, and caring enough to watch over me and take care of me in any situation I face, gives meaning and purpose to my life and makes a difference in the way I see others and treat others and in the way I plan in my own life for my goals and aspirations. Creation makes a difference. If you've ever thought about the state of Oklahoma, you might have thought of the musical Oklahoma. Or perhaps you thought of wide open spaces and natural beauty, Native Americans and cowboys and even outlaws. But anybody who's visited this state knows that it's an oil producing area. And where there's oil, there are geologists. We're going to meet one of them, Dr. Elaine Graham Kennedy. Something went wrong and things were dying in mass. It's called a mass mortality bed and it's huge in Oklahoma. The creek we're sitting beside is called Honey Creek. I would look for rocks and look for things that had fossils in them. That was something that meant a lot to me. This was a big part of my life. The rock itself has always interested me. I always wondered what we were walking on, and that was something that had a big hold on my life. And I didn't know you could make a living uh, being a geologist. I didn't even know what a geologist was. I was raised a Southern Baptist. My father and mother uh, were both Southern Baptists. I grew up in a very good home, and I never felt like uh, they were really very unfair with me. There were times when I was mad at them, but uh, like any kid, when you're a little kid, you go to all the stuff. You go to Sunday school, and you memorize Bible verses, and you are able to stand in front of the church and recite your Bible verses, and you join, in the case of the Southern Baptists at that time, they had Girls Auxiliary and Royal Ambassadors, and I went to Girls Auxiliary, and my brother went to Royal Ambassadors, and we learned a lot in those programs about the Christian walk, missionary work, that kind of thing. So I was about seven years old, and I would, had gone to bed, and I used to lay under all the covers that I could get on me in bed because then I felt safe. And I would lay there and look up at my ceiling and go beyond the ceiling and look up to God on his throne in my little mind as a child in the beautiful heaven, and I would pray. 
and talk to God about how things were going and how I was doing. And this one night, here I was already, I couldn't get past the ceiling. It was shut off and it was dark. It was so dark, I just couldn't believe how dark it was between me and God. I mean, it was night, of course, but this was horrible. And it really, it made me feel sick in my stomach. I thought, this is awful, what's happened? Why won't God hear my prayers? And then I realized, it just flashed in my mind, Elaine, this is your sin you're looking at. This is what darkness is about. It's your sin. And God can't hear your prayers because of your sin, my sin. It was just like, oh, I can't believe this. What do I do? I don't know what to do. He can't hear my prayers. I don't know how I'm going to let him know I don't want to do like this. So I got out of bed and I ran into the living room and mom and dad were watching TV. Now when mom and dad were by themselves in the living room, you weren't allowed to interrupt that kind of thing. But I was so upset. I thought I'd be, you know, a little sneaky about it or whatever. And I came in and I got down by mom's knees. And I looked up at her and I said, Mom, Mom, God won't hear my prayer. And she just kind of looked down at me and she said, Lainey, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. This is terrible. Dad was off the couch in a flash, walked over, turned off the TV. Never has been done in my entire life. Went back and sat down beside Mom. And here were these two very serious faces looking at me. So I knew that what I had just experienced was really important. And Mom said, Lenny, what happened? And I said, well, I, I was laying there and I was praying like I do every night. And it was just, I couldn't see God anymore. I couldn't pray to him and he wouldn't answer my prayers. And my prayers, they couldn't go past the ceiling and it was so dark. It was so dark, Mom. And Mom said, Lenny, God is calling you. This is the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin. Do you understand what that means? And boy, that then I got excited because I knew this is the moment when your life changes. Having grown up in the Southern Baptist Church, I knew that this was, was that moment where you are convicted of sin and you make your decision for Christ. And it is a by faith alone experience that there that everything I had done up to that point had absolutely no meaning and could not save me. No matter how many times I'd gone to Sunday school or training union or girls auxiliary, none of that mattered. What mattered was what choice was I gonna make right now. And so I knew that it was monumental only because that's the way they always talked about it at church. So I went back to bed, crawled under all the covers, looked up at that horrible ceiling. I said, oh God, I hate this. I don't like feeling like this. I don't like knowing that my sins have separated us. I don't like all this darkness. I don't want to ever, ever, ever be separated from you like this again. And I fell asleep. And I could feel the blanket of peace. And that God had accepted my repentance for my sins. And that I trusted him with my life. Dr. Kennedy seemed to have an almost perfect Christian upbringing. She had dedicated Christian parents and a wonderful Christian church family. But even under those circumstances, challenges to our faith will inevitably come into our lives. There were two things that happened in my freshman year of high school. One, I took biology and our pastor was retired and a new man came in from Baylor University. In biology class, our biology teacher was fresh out of college and he was all energized about teaching us real biology and helping us understand the living world. And one of the things he thought we really needed to do was to read Origin of Species by Darwin. Okay, we're ninth grade. We're gonna read Origin of the Species, get real. Um, most of us 
probably did what I did, which was opening paragraph, closing paragraph, read all the captions under the pictures, and you get the idea. <laughs> this guy was nuts. He was absolutely insane. I knew he was. And I wrote a very hot review of his book. And when I got my paper back from my teacher, he had written a little note up in the corner and he said, Elaine, don't let one man's ideas upset you so much. And when I heard that, I went, wow. He thinks I'm smart enough to decide for myself, to think for myself. But I don't have to agree with this guy just because he's this huge name. Wow. If I don't have to agree with him, Darwin, well, I don't have to agree with my teachers either. Now, with the second issue, here, what happened was, was our pastor, the pastor I'd grown up with, who on Wednesday nights would teach us from the Greek and the Bible. Oh man, that was so cool. I felt like I was learning the language of Christ, but that's, <laughs> you know, you're a kid. You sit there, you think things like that. But he was really a, a man of the Bible. And the last sermon he gave us in that church was about creation and God creating Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how firmly he believed that and how committed he was to that. And I thought, well, of course he is. That's, that's what the Bible says. Why would he not? The next Sunday, the new pastor showed up and his first sermon was on how we never really understood Genesis correctly. What? What's he saying? He didn't say Genesis isn't true. He didn't say that uh, it was out of date. He said we never understood it correctly. And he proceeded to lead us down the path of evolution. That God had used evolution to guide his creation in its development. And at that moment, my God stopped being a creator and became a guide. Not much power there. He's just the guy talking up front, leading the group along. He's not really involved because he's, it's nothing to him. And I didn't realize that. What I thought was, this is great. I can put my science and my faith together. I don't have to be so mad at Darwin. Maybe he thought this too, you know? It was just craziness in my head. Ninth grade, you know? Couldn't even drive a car yet. I, I was a believer. I just wasn't really sure about God's role in all this. But I knew that whatever his role, he was, he was doing it. He was in charge. And I went on. And I didn't even think about it, really. Didn't think about it much at all until I got into college. Dr. Kennedy thought she'd been given a perfect solution to the tension between the science she was learning and her faith, theistic evolution. But sometimes a solution can create more problems than it resolves. As I was coming to the end of my high school career, I had to make a decision about school. And I really didn't want to leave home. What I decided was that I would go to Phillips University, which was about, what, a mile or two from my house? I mean, it was just up the road. I started out as a history major. I was gonna be a history teacher. And I went off to history class and I got a job to pay my tuition. The person I worked for was uh, Dr. Anderson. He was the dean of the faculty at that time, but he had been the head of the, or had been part of the history faculty. What was interesting was I went through my first semester and during my first semester, I took my biology class to get it out of the way. By this time, you know, I'm, I'm well entrenched in evolution. And I finished that first semester and I got ready. I had enrolled for the second semester and I walked into my boss's office to see what he wanted me to do for that semester. And he turns to me and he says, Elaine, 
let me see your schedule. He looks at my schedule, and here I've got 12 hours on my schedule, 35 bucks for 12 hours. And he says, where's your science? I said, I've already taken my science. I took it last semester. No, this isn't good. This, 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 this won't do. He said, you need to take three hours of science this semester. I said, what? Why would I do that? He says, look, it doesn't matter whether you take 12 units or 15. And I said, well, yeah, but it, that takes a lot of time. Science always takes mo more time than any other group. And he goes, Lucky Lane, what you need in your life is academic discipline. Now, I want you to go down there to the registrar and I want you to register for this class. It's called Physical Geology for Teachers. And you're gonna be a teacher, you need this class. I handed it to me. I went down, enrolled in the class. Get to the class the first day, the professor, he tells us, we almost didn't get to have this class, but at the last minute, somebody signed up and now we have eight people in our class. And I went, I have been railroaded for this stupid course. I got halfway through the class and I went down to the registrar and changed my major to geology. It was all about science now. And I was absolutely walking on clouds. I was so happy. I did very well. I, I loved geology very much. It's common for people to think of geology as a scientific discipline that challenges Christianity. And it is true that in geology classes, there may be interpretations that are taught which run counter to what is revealed in scripture. However, sometimes the most profound challenges actually come from a different and very unexpected source. But we took a field trip. As we would go up this hill, you know, you'd have, you'd have your coral and you'd have your clams and snails. There's not a lot of mixing up except, you know, in some of the places. By and large, you could go up and you could see that things have been laid down in layers. And so I got to the top of the hill and I sat down and I was looking around, thinking about how all those little hills have got these same fossils making up those layers because they're all about the same height through this area, you know? And I looked down and I was sitting on some kind of little gravel. And so I reached down and I picked it up and I went to look at it to see what it was because I thought, maybe I can figure out what kind of uh, rock it is. And I'm looking at it and all of a sudden I realized these aren't chips of rock. These things look like weed seeds. They're a little bigger, but oh wow. These are foraminifera. Talk about a thrilling find. This was amazing. These particular forams are little tiny animals that make a coiled shell and then it kind of goes right down to a point. And then there are these vertical, these lines that go from end to end all over it. So it, it's like it's in sections, it's built up in little sections. When you see this particular one, you know you're in Permian. You don't have to date it or anything because that thing lived and died in Permian oceans. As you go up through the column, you have the old life, Paleozoic. Then you have the middle life, Mesozoic. And then you have the recent life, Cenozoic. Okay, well, we're at the top of the Paleozoic. It's where these little organisms are buried. And so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about those hills with all those fossils. And I put my hands down into the, this little gravel and lifted it up. And those forearms ran through my fingers like sand on a seashore. And I thought, what kind of a God do I serve? Because these things didn't die of old age. There would have been a lot of sediment. They would have been so scattered through sediment and other organisms would be with them. No, this is something where the chemistry or something was changing in the water. Something went wrong and things were dying in mass.
gonna get my first light up there. Okay. For as long as David could remember, he wanted to fly. And at 42, he had just about reached his goal. David was holding the control yoke for an Aero Peru Boeing 757 in his hands. And so it was on October 2nd, 1996, that David was almost there. He was, he was almost ready to move from the, the right side of the cockpit, from being a first officer, to the left side, to being a command pilot, airline captain. And so he, he greeted Captain, command pilot, Eric Schriever. He had flown with Captain Schriever many times before in the past eight and a half years as a pilot with Aero Peru. He had logged almost 8,000 hours at the controls. Captain Schriever was known to be competent, professional, and at 58 years of age, he was just two years away from retirement. And it was, it was David dream, David's dream that in that two years, he would move from the right side to the left side and be an airline captain. And so on October 2nd, they were flying out of Lima, Peru at 12.40 a.m. in the morning. It was past midnight. Two hours earlier, David had telephoned his wife, Maria, just to kiss her goodnight over the phone and to check and see that all the children were okay. He took his seat on the right side of the cockpit and he radioed the tower. He said, Aero Peru, flight 603, authorized to Santiago, Chile. Flight level 29,000 feet, transponder 5603. The tower came back. They said, correct, Lima, tower 18. Correct, David said, roger that. Captain Trevor said, let's go. David, he pushed the throttles to the big airliner all the way to the wall and he, he heard the engines roar. He pulled the control yoke toward his chest and they were in the air. But 20 seconds later, David shouted to the captain. He said, the altimeters are stuck. The altimeters tell you how high the airplane is. And Captain Schriever said, oh, wow. Now, can I be honest with you? The captain didn't really say, oh, wow. <laughs> We're in church. I, I can't tell you what he really said, right? He, he said, oh, wow. And as soon as, as soon as he said that, an alarm went off to let them know that they were going too fast. And Captain Schriever said, cut the engines. And as soon as, he as soon as he said that, another alarm went off that told them that they were going too slow. And Captain Schriever said, the airspeed indicators are, are messed up. Okay, he didn't say that. But I can't tell you what he, he really said. All right? At, at that point, at that point, the pilots had two conflicting uh, 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 horns going off. One which said that they were going too fast, and the other one which said that they were going too slow. They both could not be right because they were the opposite of each other. But guess what? They both could be wrong. Captain Schriever said, cut the engines again. And David Fernandez, his co-pilot, cut the engines. And so, so Aero Peru, flight 603, began a slow, meandering descent to the ocean. Finally, David Fernandez, the first officer, he said, I'm getting shaking, I'm getting shaking. It can't be wrong, it's mechanical. An airline is, is designed so that if the, air, if the airflow over the wing is too fast, the ailerons flutter. They, and they transfer this fluttering or shaking to the control yoke so the pilot can feel it. He can see, he can hear, he can know he's going too slow. Give the aircraft more power or else you're going to stall and you're going to fall out of the sky and you're going to crash. The last voice they heard on the cockpit voice recorder was that of Captain Eric Schriever. And he said, it's fictitious. And they slammed into the Pacific Ocean. The lives of the two pilots, the crew, and every passenger on that plane was totally dependent upon the pilot's understanding, believing, 
and accepting the science of flight. The science of flight. The co-pilot was right. One signal they had was electronic, and it could fail. The other one was mechanical. It was based on the laws of physics. It could not be wrong unless the laws of physics were wrong. Most people in this world will be lost not because they're bad people, but because they refuse to accept the science of God's creation, and rather they chose to believe evolutionary fiction. Your life is dependent upon your ability to understand the science of God's creation. What do you really believe? What do you really believe? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, it's a great privilege for me to be here in the village church in this mighty sanctuary, Lord, worshiping with my brothers and sisters, studying your creation, your science, because you are a God of science, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. So surround us with your angels, particularly the young people who are under attack on our campuses, Lord. May it be so. Amen and amen. Good morning. Um, good, oh, it's afternoon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, thank you for the, thank you for the correction. Um, my name is, uh, is Major Coleman. My name is Major Coleman. Um, Dr. Tim Stangis told you correctly that I am a, a licensed lawyer and I'm a practicing academic. Got my bachelor's degree and doctor of law degree from the University of Maryland. Master's degree, PhD, doctor of philosophy and political economy from the University of Chicago. I am associate professor and former chair of the Department of Black Studies at the State University of New York, and I am on a two-year leave of absence at Emory University doing advanced training in law and religion at the law school and at the Candler School of Theology. And I did not come here alone this morning. My beautiful wife is with me. Bebezinho, por favor, levanta. Isn't she gorgeous? She's gorgeous, isn't she? Praise God. She is a Brazilian native uh, and speaks Portuguese. We speak Portuguese to each other. Sometimes I may slip into Portuguese if I don't watch myself. Um, has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in education. But for her, her major job, she thinks, is making her husband happy. Amen? And that makes me, that makes me very happy. We're going to do just three things this morning. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to demonstrate that God is a God of science. We're going to be fast. God is a God of science. I'm going to show you what we do on secular campuses. I've spent my whole career on secular campuses, more than 30 years, what we do about science and the cross on secular campuses. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about why we are at a crisis of origins at this very moment. And it's important for us to, to understand. Okay? Here we go. God is a God of science. We read this in our opening scripture this morning. I will put in the desert the cedar tree, the myrtle tree, the olive, and I will set pines in the wasteland. I will make the fir and cypress grow together. And listen to what God says. Why is he going to do that? He's going to make pine trees grow in the desert. Why? So people may see and know and may consider and understand that God has done this. God says, that's science. There's nowhere, anywhere in Scripture that God ever asks anyone to have blind faith in Him. Anybody who has blind faith without evidence is quite frankly, I'm going to say it quite frankly here, a fool. Blind faith. God never asks for blind faith. He always gives you evidence for who He is, and that's science. What is science? Science is the use of observation, record keeping, controlled analysis um, of the empirical world that is falsifiable by others. That's what science is. And when God says, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make a pine tree grow in the desert where there's not any water, you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it with your hand, that's science. Observation, record keeping, controlled analysis. You watched it grow. It wasn't there before. There's no water. It's impossible. That's the God of the Old Testament, a God of science. Many Christians are afraid to use science. They're afraid of science because they don't understand it. God is a God of science. But that's just not the God of the Old Testament the God of the New Testament. Jesus is the God of science, amen? Amen? You remember what he said at the Last Supper when Philip asked him, he said, he said, Lord, just show up the Father, that's all we need. If we could just see God. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, Philip, have I been here so long that you don't understand yet that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? And then what did he follow? He said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If you don't believe that, believe on the basis of what? Science. Believe the evidence. Look at the miracles that you've seen. 
If, 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 if science doesn't convince you, nothing can convince you. Absolutely nothing. God is a God of science. Now, I was worried about doing this here this morning. This is, I have to be quite honest. This is the, I'm going to do a miracle this morning. Okay, this is hard. This is, uh, this is the only the second time I've done this. Okay, so I'm a little bit worried, in, particularly in front of such a, never done it in front of such a little nervous here, in front of a, a large audience. So just give me a second here. Let me see. <sighs> okay, here we go. There we go. There's the, there it is. There's your miracle. Now, that's a slide. That's a digital image, okay? So I'm going to move over here, over here to this side. I hope I don't mess up the camera people. So here we have it in reality, okay? That, that is, that's not science. So that is the, 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 the myrtle trees growing in the desert, the miracles of Jesus, that was science for the people who saw it. Was anybody here when that happened? No, it's not science for us, it's faith for us. It was science for them, it, it is faith for us. We need science for today. Here's a miracle that you can see and touch with your eyes. Evolutionists tell us that granite is made in volcanoes. So you go and ask them and say, well, show me a, a volcano where granite is being made. Can't be, cannot be produced in a laboratory. V a granite is not igneous rock. It is not made in a volcano. It's an enigma rock. We don't know how it got there. It is a, it is a miracle that you can see and that you can touch. You know what happens to granite when you melt it? It, it, it layers based on its density. It's called rhyolite. That's what happens to it when you, granite, the, the earth's crust is made out of granite. It is a miracle. That is science that God is the creator. You can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it. You don't have to have blind faith. God is a God of science, and that's a good thing. Now, I want to tell you what we do. I, I work on a, on a secular campus, okay? In fact, I'm going to make a confession here. I'm a little bit worried about this. I didn't tell anyone this. I teach, I teach in the evolutionary studies program on my campus. <laughs> they didn't know that when I came. <laughs> they assigned me a course in evolutionary studies and I thought, I said, are they crazy? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> All right, the first thing, <laughs> the first thing, <laughs> they weren't happy when they found out, I'll tell you that. The first thing we do, the first thing we do on campus is organize the Seventh-day Adventist students on a secular campus. Now, I'm going to be quite frank with you. Most Seventh-day Adventist students, when they arrive on a secular campus, they are DOA, they're dead on arrival. They left because they didn't want to go to church. The statistics are abysmal. 90% of our young people who go to college or university on a secular campus never come back to church. And I got tired of sitting there watching the blood and watching them die. And I decided that I was gonna fight for each and every one of them, Amen. for each and every one. The first thing we do is we organize the Seventh-day Adventist students. Most of the students that come to our group, they're not Seventh-day Adventist Christians. They just come for the fellowship, for the food. My wife loves to cook. We both love young people, so we organize them. But you know one thing? They are, they are, they, they're, they're not strong in, in, their, in their faith or in the knowledge that they're saved. Do you know in 30 years of teaching, I have never ever had an atheist student or a secular student ask me, Major, does Jesus love me? Never had anybody ask me that, okay? You know, they only ask two questions. The, number one, now this may sound strange to you. They ask, do, do I have to be a Christian or believe in God to go to heaven? Now you say, well, why would an atheist want to go to heaven? <laughs> atheist, do I have to be a Christian or believe in God to go to heaven? And the second question is like onto it. How does killing Jesus save the world? And don't tell them that Jesus is your substitute. You know, we, we, think, we think that people on university campuses are, or that the world, that they're that they stupid. They are not stupid, all right? They have real questions and they want real answers. If you tell them that Jesus is their substitute, you know what they're gonna say? Well, now you've answered the first question because I don't have to believe in God. I don't have to be a Christian since they, God killed Jesus instead of me. Everybody can go to heaven. Jesus is not your substitute. All right? We take them through the steps of salvation. I would love to do this here. And we do it on a university campus. The, the first step is justification. When at the incarnation, we are saved from slave, sl slavery to Satan's empire. At sanctification, we're saved from slavery to our carnal nature. When we are at, at effectuation, the old Bible term for that was crucifixion. 
all right? Annihilation might be another word for it. When, when we are put to death on the cross with Christ, we're saved from a consciousness of the results of the fall. No one can be saved from the results of the fall. Do you know what the results of the fall are? Eternal death. God said, the wages of sin is what? Is death. All right, when he told Adam, he said, if you eat that ripe mango, and we know it was a ripe mango now, that's the only fruit worth dying for. No one would die for anything else. If you eat, the, if you eat that ripe mango, what did he say? Did he say you would die? He didn't say that. He said, you will surely die. That is, you will definitely be dead. All right, There's a, there are two ways to die. Everybody has to die eternal death. You can die in the lake of fire, fully conscious of your death, or you can die in Christ on the cross, just like a baby being born, and you'll never know what happened. All right, that's what, we, that's what we teach. At glorification, when Jesus comes again, we'll be saved from the presence of sin, and when we are purified, we'll be saved from the existence of sin. That's what we teach on our campuses, the Steps to Salvation series. I'm shocked to find that Seventh-day Adventist students, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, they don't even know anything about their own church. Not even, not even the General Conference knows this. Do you know who, we, we, we ground our Seventh-day Adventist students, we teach them to be proud that they're Seventh-day Adventists, not to run, not to run away and hide. You know, we've had Seventh-day Adventist students on our campus, and you know what they do? The strong students, they go back to their homes and to their churches to have meetings. They abandon the university campus. Jesus did not send the disciples to go to church. He sent them to the world, amen? That's where the fighting is done. That's where the killing happens, all right? We stand and fight. Never run from a bully. Never, never run. Do you know who evolutionists, now, now I'm not talking about creationists, I'm talking about evolutionists. Do you know who evolutionists say invented creation science? <laughs> it's amazing, Adventists don't even know, they don't even know, they believe in their own prophet. Um, evolutionists state that Seventh-day Adventists and Ellen G. White invented creation science in the 19th century. Now it is, they're not saying that as a compliment, but I, I'm saying like, Good night, <laughs> man, that's, that is the most fabulous thing that I ever heard in my life. Seventh-day Adventist, Ellen G. White and Seventh-day Adventist invented modern creation, creation, scientists, creation science. My mentor, the person who taught me creation science, Dr. Walter Brown, he is not a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. He was an evolutionist, okay, until he studied the science and he changed, he became, he became a, a creation scientist, one of the greatest in the world. Not a Seventh-day Adventist, but he, he, he studied how, how the flood happened. He heard that Ellen G. White was a prophetess. He said, now, wait, listen, he, I'm a scientist, all right, I don't play. He said, listen, you say that Ellen G. White is a prophetess. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read her where I understand that she had the gift of prophetic vision. I'm going to read her work, and I'm going to see. And he, he read Ellen White, and you know what he said? He said, my God, she's legit. She saw the flood. Dr. Walter Brown of the Center for Scientific Creation confirmed that 100 years before the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was discovered, Ellen G. White described how the subterranean water exploded, creating Noah's flood. Confirmed. We have to affirm those people who affirm us, amen? Whether they're Seventh-day Seventh Adventists or, 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 or not, the next thing we do after, after we have them, after they're, after they're grounded in their faith, next we go to the science, what we call our origins series, the scientific, historical, and theological questions most Christians take for granted, but for which the world demands and deserves answers. We assume that God created the world. We assume that the Bible is true. We assume that God exists. And how often do we, do we back up our assumptions with evidence? The world is waiting to hear. Why don't we let the truth, why don't we let the truth loose? Okay? So in, 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 in 2000, in, in, on May 5th of this year, the State University of New York campus the first and only time, the State University of New, New York campus, we held our second, it was actually the second time we did it, but the first time we advertised it, Origins and Basic Assumptions Conference. We were the first Christian group on campus to advertise a university-wide event. Most Christians are afraid of evolutionists. We advertised it to the whole university community. And do you know what the Evolutionary Studies Department did? 
they wrote a letter <laughs> to the entire university campus opposing our conference, opposing our conference. I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm in evolutionary studies. I invited them to come. So what, you know what we did? We wrote a letter to the entire university campus. And we told them, we said, why are you so afraid? Tell you what, I'll show up on May 5th, Saturday morning, with a $20,000 cashier's check for any evolutionist who has a PhD in science who's got the courage to come forward and debate me in public. $20,000, I'll sign it over to you, it's made out to me. $20,000, not a lot of money, but you can buy a pizza with it, <laughs> okay? You can buy a pizza with it. <sighs> on Saturday morning, May 5th, you wanna know how many of them showed up? Not a single one. They're afraid of real science. They're a real science. Never run, never run, never run from a bully. We had 100 books on display, both evolution and creation titles. We're not afraid. Read Darwin's Origin of the Species. See how silly it sounds, okay? 100 titles. We had a life-size models of the animal cages in Noah's Ark to show that it could have had high technology, self-watering, self-cleaning, self-feeding. The largest, the largest authentic model of Noah's Ark in the world. No one can build a life-size model of Noah's Ark in the world. There were 19th and 20th century wit eyewitnesses of the Ark. The Ark was 540 feet long and it was not made out of lumber. Excuse me. <laughs> no boat made out of lumber would survive Noah's flood. It was, made out of, it was made out of hewn logs. The walls were over three feet thick. There's no such thing as a 540 foot long tree. You cannot build a life-size model of Noah's Ark. This is the largest authentic model of Noah's Ark in the world. It's a, it's a 400 square foot layout. We'd have to take out most of the cheer, chairs here for it to fit in. I'd love to bring it here one day. Students can see it, they can touch it. We, we, put, we put to scale dinosaurs right there. They can see that every major land animal in the world, including the largest brachiosauruses, could easily fit on Noah's Ark on the first floor with their food and water. The Ark was sadly empty. All of them could fit there. They can see the science. What are the results of this? Our results are we take surveys at everything. We want to know what's happening. Our results are hardcore evolutionary students, students who come to our program who say, I believe evolution, not theistic evolution, creation is false, evolution is true. 40% of them who come to the conference leave saying, I don't believe in evolution anymore. <laughs> Evolutionists are afraid of the science. The only way they can win are, is by keeping the science away from our young people. I'm happy to say that we were able to record the video um, and we are gonna make it available this weekend for the first time. I'm proud to say that Dr. Standish's organization, the Geoscience Research Institute, supported our conference as well as the Public Campus Ministries Department of the General Conference. They supported us on a public, on a public university campus. I'm, I'm so proud of them. This is a great conference. I, I, I would like to say amen to them. Amen to them and, and, to what the, and to what they are doing. Along with, that, along with that, we also have Dr. Walt Brown's book that's available at the ABC, and we're giving it away for free. It's 600 pages, full color. We're giving it away for, to free, for free to first come, to first, first serve. And I'd like to give away, I only have two copies here with me. I'd like to give one to my good friend, Dr. Ryan Hayes. Ryan, come on up. I'd like to give one to him. All right, just to say thank you for everything that oh, you, man, you, you've awesome. done. All right, and pastors, pastors, Dr. Reeves, please, please come up. Pastors are the first line of defense in science, okay? Students will come to you. They won't come to me. They'll come to you um, um, to know the science, all right? We have to put this in, every, in, everyone's, in everyone's hands, okay? The, why, is, right, why are origins a crisis? Because remember what Jesus, he said, false Christ will appear and they will have performing great signs and miracles to deceive, to deceive many. The first signal, intelligible signal from outer space, the whole world will be deceived because they will think that life can evolve on far, foreign planets. The churches will lose their power overnight. That's why Jesus said, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Only if you know that God is a God of science will you not be deceived. The Peruvian Air Force could not find the black box. Many people are surprised to find that a black box is not black. <laughs> it was two miles down in the ocean. They asked the US Navy to come. They sent robots down and they pulled it up. And what they found, they were shocked. 
They were found that when the first officer told the, co told the pilot that he was getting shaken, the pilot ignored it. When the first officer told the pilot that their radar altimeter said that they were too low, they ignored it. And the third thing was the worst thing of all. They found out that the passengers did not die on impact. They drowned slowly as the airplane sunk into the black ocean. It resulted in one of the highest damage awards in airline history. The pilots had a responsibility to understand the, the science of flight. You and I have a responsibility to our young people to know and understand science and to protect them from the fierce assaults of Satan, the crisis of origins, and God's science, scientific imperative. What do you really believe? May it be so. Thank you so much. Anywhere with Jesus. That's next, right? Amen. Anywhere with Jesus. I can sh safely go. Anywhere. Anywhere. Anywhere with Jesus. Stand, Stand up. Father, thank you. Thank you for being the creator, but thank you for being our savior. Thank you for surrounding our, our young people on our college campuses with your angels and, and filling them with your Holy Spirit. May we go forth from this day ready to challenge Satan wherever he is, wherever he is. Who are these uncircumcised Philistines who challenge the armies of the living God? Anywhere with Jesus, we can safely go. May it be so. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.